welcome to the third debate of uh, the battle over scientific information strand. Uh, this one's entitled Science Journalism, the Tyranny of Evidence, question mark. I do think we need to try and put it in a bit of a wider context, the problem of science journalism, because I think there is a wider context, and it starts from a, just identifying the fact of this preoccupation with evidence-based policy is a very novel phenomenon. You know, if you look back to the when Beveridge and, and Attlee and Bevan introduced the welfare state, they didn't claim that it was based on scientific evidence or scientific research. You know, they, they justified it by the ideology of new liberalism or the ideology of state socialism and on the authority of the Liberal Party and the post-war Labour government. That was the basis on which they motivated that major introduction of, of, of government policy. When Margaret Thatcher and her colleagues set about dismantling the welfare state, they didn't claim randomised controlled trials had shown the benefits of their particular policy. It was justified in terms of unleashing the free market, anti-state, monetarism, and all those familiar doctrines. Now, whatever you think about them, you know, that was what the debate about policy was about then. And I think what we've seen uh, since then is the demise of... Uh, ideological, p political controversy uh, as the major determinant of policy and as the source of authority of government, and the ascendancy of scientific evidence as other forms of authority have been discredited. It's almost that science is the last man standing in terms of legitimizing government policy. And that we see a sort of outsourcing of government authority to science in all areas. So if you're introducing a new social policy or a new educational policy or a new health policy, some sort of scientific expert, some sort of scientific research has got to be produced uh, to justify it. And yet it, one of the most striking measures of that, actually, that this thing even affects anybody who is opposed to the mainstream drift of policy, and even from the most unlikely areas. For example, in the recent uh, controversy over abortion in Ireland, where you might think that the Catholic Church would justify its opposition to the measures on the grounds of some theological argument. No, it's actually justified in terms of a scientific medical argument that ab abortion causes higher incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder or uh, uh, arguments of that sort. So in other words, even opponents of scientific uh, uh, issues uh, uh, couch their arguments in terms of science. The religious fundamentalists have spawned the idea of creation science to, to uh, legitimise their position. You know, uh, fundamentalist religious people did not used to justify their arguments in terms of a science. Now, science rules everything, so whether you're on one side of the argument or another, you've got to put it in scientific, argue, in scientific terms. So the consequence of all this is that science has been remorselessly politicised and moralised, and that's created tremendous problems for the way in which science is, is dealt with, and it's created great problems for the media. And I think that's the context in which we have to discuss. That's what the, 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 the burden that's been put on science... I mean, people think that science is, is uh, you know, becomes so, so influential because Brian Cox is rather sexy on television and Dara O'Brien is, you know, quite funny, that this is why science has suddenly become fashionable. That's, it's because everything else has collapsed. Science is the only thing left, and science is having to do the... The burden of justifying everything else and, and justifying every uh, uh, intervention in every area of social policy and, and almost public life. My question is about the kind of authoritarianism that you can see in what you might call some of the science lobby. So uh, the example that I'll give is a magazine called What Doctors Don't Tell You, which recently, it kind of publishes things, all oh, vaccines are very bad and things like that, but recently people have started campaigning to have supermarkets withdraw it from their shelves. I th I'm perfectly in favour of evidence-based medicine, but I think that's a pernicious attack on free speech. And I think it shows a really kind of fragile conception of what science is if you have to go out and try and clamp down on your enemies rather than win the argument. What do the, the panel think? I did a year in uh, public relations with a pharmaceutical company as a client who can boo now. Um, <laughs> but looking at how the procedure works... I think a lot of the people we were dealing with kind of forego whether they can call themselves science journalists at all. You know, a, bit, a big hit was to have the press release copy-pasted, more or less, into the article. If they took the photo as well, that's another uh, hit for the PR company. If the journalist is rewriting the press release, then often the um, abstract or executive summary of the report from the pharmaceutical company got a rewrite too. But the actual proportion of journalists who even asked for 
the re original report was very small in that market. And this is uh, four or five years ago. So it's, it's a good case for being very kind of sceptical about the real level of engagement, even with the raw materials. It's a different thing from saying, oh, yeah, they misread it. But often you're d dealing with the health correspondent of a particular publication, and they're working off two A4 sheets of paper that have come out of the PR company. And of course, as on the PR side, we've got every interest in uh, going back to the PR company at the end of the month and saying, yeah, well, that's a victory for us. You've got, got it as part of your PR retainer. It would have cost you this much in advertising and so on. So often, you know, journos are complicit in the process uh, to an extent which they're not even wrongly engaging with the material. They're just recycling what we, what we give them. I think there's an important distinction to be made between communicating science and reporting science. Communicating science is what the best science journalists do, where you're explaining a complex science report to a non-expert audience. We, we really need that, and I admire the people who can do that. Reporting science, I'm a journalist. I write for a serious news service, but not a science journalist um, service. I try, when I'm reporting on a science report, I reported the IPCC climate study, to treat it as I would any news, an election result, a proposal for a law, you know, the Democrats win the election in America, you wouldn't dream of only giving space to the Democrat, the Democrat position. With something, with a scientific report, if you give, you don't have to take an opinion, you just give space to critics of that report, you're accused of being irresponsible because the majority of scientists said one thing, which is, is what a lot of the panel have been saying. Scientists are treated as this, there's this authority that you're not allowed to question. I think if the science reporting if it was expected that you treat it more like any other subject without doing away for the need for the science, uh, scientific uh, journalists, I think that would, that would help a lot with the problem you've been touching on. This um, science is another. It's not like an election result. It's not like a proposal for a law. It's, it's, um, it's a religion. We, we, can't, we can't question this um, in uh, a country which doesn't allow freedom of speech. I, I kind of want to sort of offer an alternative perspective here because I feel like the root of the problems of science journalism really exists in science itself, especially high-impact science, because the, the, the two examples in my mind about this going wrong are Andy Wakefield and the Lombardi XMRV CFS link. Those were both high-impact studies uh, in really big papers, and I kind of feel like science is obsessed with being right, and it isn't prepared to sort of pursue knowledge for knowledge's sake. I mean, anybody who's been in the academic field would know that when you write your grant application for money to do your science, you claim it cures cancer, you know, does something about male pattern bot boldness and does everything else. And I feel like the, these problems in science journalism really sort of have their root in the sensationalism that exists within science. And I feel like we should perhaps acknowledge that Grants are given out not ba necessarily based on evidence, but rather based on policy. So it really is a self-perpetuating problem, isn't it? I've had a de debate with the, the... I can't remember her name now, the editor of What Doctors Don't Tell You. And I, completely, I, I completely agree with your point that we should be strongly opposed to the censorship of absolutely scurrilous and rubbish uh, publication. But uh, I think the, the point about it, and I offered actually in the course of the discussion at an anti-vaccine conference, I offered actually to have a formal debate with her, which she turned down. Much to my disappointment, rather in the same spirit, I've recently been turned down. Andy Wakefield announced uh, that he was prepared to debate the ongoing issues of the MMR controversy, and I, I, I was the only person that accepted it. Once I accepted it, he found some other reason not to engage in the argument. But that also goes back to reminding of back at the start of the MMR controversy, not at the height of the MMR controversy, when there was a, uh, the, uh, people may remember Wakefield was uh, uh, the subject of this hagiographical Channel 5 documentary, Hear the Silence, in which he was depicted as the heroic doctor, listening to the, all that stuff. Um, it, you know, it was the sort of high point of the campaign. And the Channel 5 and Channel 4 were feeling under defence. Uh, they felt obliged to organise a debate about it. And what was interesting about the debate was there was a complete embargo put on participation on anybody involved in the world of medicine or science. Everybody completely refused to engage in the, de in the debate on the, on the grounds that, uh, you know, that basically if we ignored him, he would go away. 
and that uh, it would just give him more publicity. And it was just uh, an evasion of the arguments that had been raised. And the point, the problem, the, the, I, should, I mean, the only people, just to, for the record here, the only people who had agreed to go on that program was me, Evan Harris, the Liberal Democrat MP as he was then, and the courageous Anjana Ahuja of the, the Times newspaper. But the entire scientific and medical establishment dodged that debate at that time. And, I, the, the, and that's the, the, the spirit of this general thing, is that if you ignore it or try and suppress it, that that's the way to deal with controversies in this area. It just doesn't work, and it's, it's patronising, it's condescending to people. And the, the point that, they, that you can't get away from it, and the reason why I'm prepared to engage in these discussions with people I fundamentally disagree with, is because there are many parents out there in the world of people looking at, uh, concerned about vaccinations and people in the world of autism who still accept the, some validity in these theories. As long as that is the case, then it's an argument that's worth having and should be engaged. And the more publicity it gets, the more debate there is about it, the more what doctors can't, don't tell you, whatever it's called, is widely available, the better. To make it a little bit more scientific, I want to ask the panel what, what they think, whether they think that the coverage of science issues that are policy-related, like climate change, medical and health issues, and so on, whether that's any worse than the coverage in the press of um, broader science questions, which have no immediate policy implications. I mean, as somebody who's interested in science and a science fiction writer and so on, I do read the, uh, pay some attention to the science journalism in newspapers, and it's almost uniformly rubbish. Um, paleontology, astronomy, they always get it wrong. I remember in one respectable newspaper just a few years ago, and as an example that stuck in my mind, somebody thought that Ichthyosaurus was a mammal uh, somebody else, the same journalist, in fact, a quite reasonable science journalist, said that nanotechnology dealt with particles so small that the laws of physics didn't apply to them. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a problem about science in the media, but it doesn't start in the media, and it's, uh, it is about the, the role science is called upon to play in society. It's amplified in the media, and it's dramatised in the media, and it has a major impact through the media, but it doesn't start there. It starts in the wider role, as I say, science has been called, called, to, called upon to play in legitimating public policy. Now, one of the aspects of that is the instrumental manipulation of science in the pursuit of different sorts of policy. And, you know, I've, as a GP, I've lived through... I mean, I'm, sometimes I look back, I'm amazed my patients are still alive. You know, in the time I've been in general practice, there, were, there was a strong scientific consensus that the patient population was going to be decimated on several occasions by a HIV AIDS, by uh, BSE mad cow disease CJD, by bird flu, by pandemic flu. I mean, I don't... You know, these were major public health scaremongering was engaged upon around these issues with a, the science authoritatively proclaimed that these were going to decimate the population unless... Uh, uh, people took very drastic actions and all sort of, and apart from a vast amount of money being wasted and resources around these sort of scares, it did have a major impact on, on, on public life and on, on, on patients and created a tremendous amount of anxieties. And I think that's not, and that's why somebody said, you know, does it really matter that, uh, you know, that most of the stuff in all the papers is rubbish? It's true, but, you know, the, there are wider consequences of these, uh, these, this sort of manipulative, moralising use of science. Uh, uh, in this way, which, uh, you know, one of the, the, the famous uh, uh, justifications for going back to the HIV AIDS policy in Britain was that it was the good lie, you know, that there was never any serious risk of it becoming a major threat uh, uh, in British society. But the government launched the Tombstones and Icebergs campaign. It was the good lie because it, it was supposed to encourage people into a form of sexual behaviour which they thought they ought to be engaging in. There was no scientific basis for that, but it was considered to be what uh, the government wanted. Therefore, the, the, the uh, science was produced to legitimise that sort of policy. Now, that, I'm afraid, is a, a, a sort of approach to the use of science in relation to public policy is very widespread and has very damaging consequences both for science and for, for the public. One of the reasons I might be going to go back to the what doctors don't tell you question, I might be a bit sensitive to this thing because I wrote a pamphlet in 1987 critical of the HIV AIDS government policy at the time, which there was a campaign to have removed from the bookshelves of many shops. And so I'm very wary of censorship around these sorts of issues uh, because I can, I've personally experienced it. My problem with the discussion is that 
I mean, I'm a scientist, and I, first of all, I have uh, no time for uh, journalists who are arguing that they can't have the scientific facts correct. Uh, like any other jobs, you do your job properly. So if you're not a scientist, you go and get the data from the scientist to explain to you. But my, my, my main discussion is that the discussion about science it seems to be, it's a, it's a bit like saying, I don't, it's not my opinion, it's the science saying something. So why not saying that it's uh, your opinion? On the discussion about the climate change, for example, some people disagree with the consensus, the same as in science. We know that we have data, the scientists interpret data, they disagree with each other, there is nothing wrong with that. So why is it that when people are, uh, I mean, discussing in, in, journal, in, journal, I'm sorry, in journals or in the media, they don't upfront say, this is my opinion, instead of saying, this is a science say. You see this in debates all the time on any topic now. Somebody makes a, uh, suggests a solution to a problem. Someone else says, what's your evidence for that? Which is a rhetorical move because it's talking about the future and there is no evidence yet. So what would be a much more useful question would be to ask, what are your reasons for that? Which allows scope for values, ideas, logic, other things to come in, the sorts of thing that Mike was talking about earlier. So I think there's too much evidence and not enough reason. Just an example, there was a, a report published, uh, reported in, the, in the several papers about six months ago, claiming a link between, the some scientific study has shown a link between traffic pollution and autism. And uh, it was in the same week as there was a, another study showing a link between lead and crime and uh, this familiar sort of thing. I mean, people I often say this is a preserve of the Daily Mail. None of these reports are in the Daily Mail. They were all in the broadsheet newspapers. And one of the interesting things about the pollution autism report, when you just put back to the, one of the scientists involved in the, one of the leading Cambridge uh, uh, research places in relation to autism, made the point, agree, yes, the evidence is very weak and you can't, it's an association rather than a causation, but we're all opposed to traffic pollution, so uh, you know we can agree with it. That it's a useful thing to put out, and it, so it doesn't really matter if the science is crap. We, we're all against pollution, so uh, we'll go along with it. And I think that's because it does matter actually, because uh, it matters in relation to the science. It matters in relation to the public impact that those sort of statements have. And I think one of the very good sections of Mark's book is a, a section on evidence abuse, and it provides a very useful example of the abuse of evidence in this sort of way. And the criteria by which scientists can judge whether a particular environmental factor is, is, uh, can be uh, accepted as having a causative relation to any particular disease are very well established. The famous Austin Bradford Hill uh, criteria, nine points. He, he was the one that, with, with uh, Richard Dahl, discovered the lung cancer smoking link. It's a very simple thing. All these associations, which are reported every a very, it's a very familiar feature, they usually meet either none or one of... Bradford Hill's nine criteria. So it's not rocket science to dis dismiss them. But what's interesting is that the, the problem of the, the and this is the, the, my conclusion to the, a plea to science journalists, would be to apply their rigor about scientific abuse, not so much in relation to things that they're generally in favor of, like vaccines or uh, action against climate change, but in relation to some other things which they may, may not be very sympathetic towards, like smoking or screening or supposed links between diet and health, and promote some, some, some application of the principles of evidence abuse to some of the claims around the, these sort of things.